Welcome to St John's Worship at Home. Well, we find ourselves truly at home today. South Australia is under lockdown conditions for seven days. We're experiencing what people in the eastern states have been going through for some time longer, not to mention people in many other parts of the world. Our lockdown began on Tuesday at six o'clock. And in light of the announcement, many people hit the shops to buy some staples to get us through the seven days. None of us ever knew how important toilet paper was, but it seems to be the one thing that symbolises our life under COVID-19. And pastor as well, according to the State Director of Foodland. But he also assured us that there is plenty to go around. So there's no need to panic. And yet we still do. Today our Gospel reading tells the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. It's in all of our Gospels. John tells us that Jesus has attracted a great crowd of people who want the healing that they've heard he gives. Unlike us, they are away from home and they are hungry as well. How do Jesus and his disciples respond to this developing crisis? At this strange time, what are we looking for from Jesus our Lord? What does he have to offer to us in this peculiar time of lockdown? Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus is my prayer for us as we gather today to worship him in our homes. I kneel before the Father, Paul says, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, God may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. May God do this among us as we worship today. I'm going to read our Gospel lesson today from John chapter 6. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they've all had had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. This is the Gospel of the Lord. The year was 1930, the beginning of the Great Depression. 
In the Melbourne suburb of Brunswick, there are over 4,000 unemployed. A newspaper report in the Sun Pictorial observed that as there is not sufficient food to go around for relief distribution to the Brunswick unemployed today, 622 tickets bearing numbers and 200 blanks will be drawn from a hat. Those fortunate enough to get a ticket were able to purchase some food. Others sadly went without. This was called sustenance or more popularly the susso. Now perhaps there are one or two people in the St John's community who are old enough to remember the Great Depression or at least the after effects. Over 30% of the Australian workforce were unemployed compared to 5% now. Many people had to live on the breadline. They had to line up for hours in the hope that they might get some food relief. Many men were forced to travel to the bush in the hope of finding work. The announcement of this week's lockdown taps into some of these primal fears. We rush the aisles of our local supermarket, even though rationally we know that there is enough to go around. To put the best construction on things, perhaps people don't want to leave their homes under any circumstances for the next seven days. And to do that safely, of course, we need the staples, bread, milk, pasta, meat, veggies, fruit, and of course, toilet paper. On the other hand, this rush is perhaps pointing to a desire that we have to maintain some kind of control over at least some aspect of the current situation. It's not a stretch to say that the people Jesus encounters in today's gospel are in a desperate situation, one that is much worse than ours. As Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Now, some of them would have been sick themselves and hoping that Jesus would heal them. But most, if not all of them, would have been poor, living day by day, not actually being sure of where the next meal might be coming from. Now, this is the kind of fear that we do not know, at least not in the last 50 or 60 years. But we do have fears and we do have needs. What do we bring to Jesus today? Now, I'm sure that all of us are concerned about the pandemic and how it won't be over any time soon. And our anxiety levels may have increased as it has come much closer to home again in these last days. Yes, we're frustrated at the slow rollout of vaccines, which will, in time, keep us safer. So what can we learn from Jesus today? Well, first of all, we see that Jesus can change his plans. He had intended to spend some private time teaching his disciples, but the gathering crowd put an end to that. Perhaps we might say, to use a buzzword, that Jesus pivoted to face the situation in front of him. He begins by drawing in his disciples to help him solve a problem. He asks Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And then he goes on, John goes on to say, he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Now, Philip was a realist, and he says it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Now, I wonder what Jesus thought of this answer. Hadn't Philip seen Jesus healing the official son and the paralysed man at the pool of Bethesda, which we read about in John 5? Shouldn't Philip have said, Lord, I believe that you can deal with this even if I don't know how? Andrew, however, seems a little more hopeful. Here's a boy, he says, with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? This seems inconsequential, but perhaps this little, like the little faith that Jesus calls for from his disciples, this will be enough for Jesus to work with. So Jesus does get to work. He gets the disciples to order people to sit down. Jesus then took the loaves, 
he gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. Then, when everyone's finished, Jesus orders the disciples to collect all the leftovers. Who could have believed that there would be more than enough? They gathered them and they filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Now this reminds us of how God provided for his people's needs when they were journeying through the desert. And in fact, Jesus makes a reference to the Passover, the meal of celebration. God said in Exodus chapter 16, at twilight you will eat meat and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. This manna, which literally means what is this? This would be their staple food for the journey through the desert. With this in mind, it's no wonder that those who witnessed what happened this day got excited about the possibility of putting Jesus in charge of the whole show. Jesus, however, resisted this temptation for power and glory. Now, it's not that he didn't care for people. He fed 5,000 and that showed that he certainly cared for their physical needs. And that's, of course, too, why Jesus teaches us to pray. Give us today our daily bread. Our physical condition matters to God. But in the next petition of the Lord's Prayer, we are alerted to our even more desperate need. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Now this was the much more that John goes on to speak about in the rest of John chapter that Jesus speaks about in the rest of John chapter 6. Life is about much more than simply being fed physically. We have deeper needs. We have a need for love, for security, for a meaning for life, for a sense of purpose. And these are the things that Jesus talks about next. Again, the next day, the crowds come to speak to Jesus. They want more of what Jesus has offered. But instead of another miracle, Jesus leads them into the deeper question. Not about the food that perishes, but the food that endures for eternal life. The most fundamental human need is to have a relationship with the God who has created us and who loves us. But this is not exactly what most people wanted to hear. Sadly, even at the end of the chapter, some of Jesus' disciples. God wants to feed people spiritually, not to ensure that we have a cushy and luxurious life. Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 prefigures his offering of his life for the sake of the spiritual health of all people. Jesus says the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And in case people didn't draw the right conclusion, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, none of us is going to go hungry over the seven days of lockdown. Our food supply chain is working well. Supermarket shelves are restocked overnight. And we can go shopping for our basic needs. But the pandemic as a whole, as well as this most recent lockdown, has uncovered a whole lot of deeper hungers. The future is quite uncertain at most levels from the personal, certainly at the global. Some of you have spoken to me about the sense that perhaps we have lived through the best years in our country in the last decades and that the years to come may be much more fraught. And that's not what any of us would hope for, and especially for our children and grandchildren. COVID-19 has uncovered some deep-seated insecurities. And my experience has been that people have been more willing to talk about some of these bigger life questions. We are all concerned. 
There is a heightened level of concern and for some of us anxiety. What might happen if we get sick? What about our financial future? So many questions, ones that really matter. And the good news is that we believe in a God who answers these deep needs and provides us with the deepest eternal security. We know a saviour whose words and actions show beyond doubt that God cares for us physically, yes, but also spiritually, body and soul. Jesus says later in John chapter 6, No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father, and I will raise him up on the last day. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. The image Jesus uses here is of a fish being dragged into a net, caught up in its sweep as the fishing boat glides through the water. The fish don't know it's coming, but they can't get away. Without the prior action of God, we cannot know Jesus. We can't believe his audacious claims. Luther, when he preached on John 6, commented, People may forever do as they will. They can never enter heaven unless God takes the first step with his word, which offers them divine grace and enlightens their hearts so as to get upon the right way. This is what we have experienced in Jesus and this is what we have experienced today in his word. He came down to us, became one of us, meeting our needs for a meaningful present and a hopeful future. He doesn't wait until we are worthy or till we've allayed all our fears. He spends his life on the cross for our sake. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of of the world. Jesus offers up his body as the perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world. In his body he obeys the law of God and he satisfies its demands on our behalf and he does this willingly and freely. This then is the spiritual breadline on which we live, sustained by the bread of life. And like the sasso about which I spoke at the beginning, we need have no doubts about receiving food to eat, nor is this a restrictive diet. We who are spiritually hungry, we come in faith through God's gracious initiative to feed on the living bread. We do so through the witness of the word and in the intimacy of a shared meal with brothers and sisters feasting on Jesus' body and blood through bread and wine, and we look forward to when that will be able to happen again. Living on this bread line fills us for an energetic and active life of faith. As Luther put it, from that moment on, the moment of faith, a person loves his neighbour and helps him as his brother. He rescues him, he gives to him, he loans to him and does nothing for him but that which he would desire his neighbour to do for himself. That's what we can do in the security of God's love. We God's people have the calling to love our neighbour and quite literally at this time, perhaps only our neighbour, especially during times of lockdown, checking in with them, checking in with one another, also ensuring that people, first of all, are physically cared for, particularly those who live alone. But many more people in our community, they're spiritually hungry. In normal times, they've been good at covering it up. But this pandemic has pulled the rug from under people's feet. So we also care spiritually. We pray for one another, with, for friends, for neighbours, and that's a great start. We pray too for an opportunity to speak of Jesus, the bread of life. And the greatest act of love in which we can engage is to lead the spiritually hungry to the place where they can be fed. Someone once described evangelism simply as this, one beggar telling another beggar where to find food.
Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Amen. Here are some questions that you might like to discuss in your household or ponder on your own. What fears do you bring into this lockdown? What do you hear from other people? Have you found greater opportunities to talk about spiritual matters during COVID-19? And thirdly, how does feeding on Jesus, the bread of life, help you through this strange time? In the St. John's email that was sent out on Friday, there are a list of prayers for our community, particularly praying for those who are bereaved. So you might like to stop the video at this point and pray for those in our community and also pray for the COVID situation in Australia and across the world and any needs personal to you and your family. You might also like to pray this prayer now, which will come onto the screen. Please join with me. Thank you, merciful God, for the great love you've shown us in Christ. Draw us more and more into his love and to reflect his love by our care and concern for other people. Amen. In this time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favour and give you peace. Amen. I want to conclude today with further words from Ephesians chapter 3. May these words give us encouragement. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.